and we are live people. Good to see all of you. Hey, Christ Apologetics, good to see you. Hey, Ken Narida. Nice to see you too. It's quite, it's a bit late over here, but I'll try to wrap things up for today within an hour and a half, if God wills. Good to see you, Emil, Jeremy, Ben Yosef, Dean XYZ, Tiger. Okay, folks, as we just come together, you can just make a short prayer. Oh, Almighty and Eternal God, help me to make this session edifying to, to your church here. Help me to strengthen me with your spirit that I may glorify your name and not do it for my own uh, pride and ego and all these kind of things. Just purify my intentions. And uh, I ask the intercession of your spirit for this connection to be, to be say, safe, secure. We don't run into any kinds of issues. And uh, may the Lord use me mightily to defend his word. We make this prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Oh yeah, Jeremy, let's see. Uh, depends. It could go a bit longer. It could go a bit shorter. And I think it's going to be a two or a three part stream by the look of it. Is the mic good, guys? Just checking it out. Is the mic good? Just waiting for your response. It's loud and clear. Good. Good to see you, Ben Yosef. Uh, just a thing. We have here with us today in the chat Christ Apologetics. He's a Christian apologist from India. He does quite a lot of videos, especially on, say, biblical scholarship the views on the Trinity, very rich content. You could just support his channel. He's also regular on Sam's channel, although he mostly stays quiet and listens most of the time. So please feel free to subscribe to his channel. He's also approaching about 1,000 subscribers. So it would be great if you guys can give you your support. Christ Apologetics. Oh, you're from Malaysia. Okay, all right. So my bad. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, you got me fooled. But yeah. Jeremy Wong's from Malaysia. <laughs> yeah, I, I've seen you. You're mostly quiet in the street. Uh, Jeremy Wong, he's not uh, Malaysian Chinese. He's Malaysian Indian. <laughs> I'm not sure how good this is Malaysian. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Okay. I'll just share and come to the topic. Okay, fine. Christ Apologetics knows some good Malaysian. Maybe you guys could collaborate at some time on a stream. That would be great together. Share my screen. Here we go. Can you see my screen, guys? Can you guys see my screen? Okay. All good. Let me know if the text isn't big enough. Just try to get to the slideshow. Okay. Now, coming to the book of Daniel. The prophet Daniel. In the chat, whoever has not heard of the prophet Daniel, anyone, you could just say, one, I haven't heard of him. But I suppose, like as Christians, we have all heard of prophet Daniel. Okay? He is one of the four major prophets in the Old Testament. All right. Hey, creative housewife. 
So thanks for subscribing. Thank you for your support and God bless you. So where do I begin? Now in your Bible, in our Bible, you know, modern liberal scholarship, they attack three books the most, three particular books the most. Hey, Ahmad Ghani, good to see you. Three particular books the most. Which ones? Genesis, Daniel, and Isaiah. These are among the three most attacked books by modern scholars in your Bible. Oh, yes, Sabyasachi Mukherjee, I am aware about that objection, but I won't cover it off today. I might briefly go, go through it. I might cover it off in part two. Okay, so guys, just to be clear, did you guys get me? Like three of the most attacked books in the Old Testament are Genesis, Daniel, and Isaiah. Okay, today's topic, we'll just be covering... Daniel, and I think this might be a two or a three part series, God willing. Yes, even kids from Sunday school know about Prophet Daniel. The first thing you'll hear about the Prophet Daniel if you are a child is his story in the lion's den and how he got saved from him. That uh, Darius to meet through him in the lion's den, he was falsely accused, and then Daniel was saved from the lions. And then at the end of the day, his, accu his accusers were thrown in the den. Okay, but right now, Daniel is right now inside the den of the modern liberal scholars. Okay, uh, do you guys know at what point in time did Daniel live? At what point in time did Daniel live? I'm just looking at the chat. Roughly, which century, which year? Just looking at the chat. Anyone? I know there's a 10 second. Yeah, around 600 BC. Yes, Ahmad Ghani. That's correct. So Daniel was actually born around 600 BC. Uh, no, Emil. 1500 BC. No, not really. That's around the time Moses lived. Moses lived around 1500 BC. 1500, 1400 BC, actually. Daniel lived during the exile. Yes, around 600 BC. So Daniel was, say, born sometime before 600 BC. You could say around 610 BC, roughly around that point of time. He was born roughly around 610 BC. And then when, and then like when Nebuchadnezzar had attacked uh, uh, Jerusalem for the first time in 605 BC, he had taken Daniel, who was a little child, with him to exile. Okay. So I'll just go to my slideshow, present. Just checking if my slideshow is visible to you guys. Guys, is my slideshow visible to you? So this is just an overview of the book of Daniel, the story of Daniel. So, okay, cool. All good, Ahmad Khani. Yes, Ben Yosef, those are one of the arguments for it. But that argument doesn't quite work if uh, you happen to be a Protestant Christian. That argument doesn't quite work. It's a weak argument if you happen to be a Protestant Christian. If you happen to be a Catholic or an Orthodox, go for it. Because the Septuagint Daniel includes chapters 13 and chapter 14, which is not there in the Hebrew Daniel. So I wouldn't use that argument. Since I'm a Catholic, yeah, I will say it's a strong argument. But if you're a Protestant, no, nah, avoid using that argument. I mean, it, it is a good argument, but it's kind of weak for a Protestant. Okay, so just coming to Daniel. So he lived sometime around 610 BC to 530 BC, roughly. And uh, of course, Jews and Christians do attribute that book to him. And all of us know from childhood about the story. Okay. Now, who was Daniel? Daniel was someone from the Jewish royal family, uh, so one of the nobles, you could say, who's one of their children. 
and he was raised up in the Babylonian court to become an administrator of the king of Babylon. You will get this information if you read Daniel 1 and Daniel 2. So Daniel was basically raised up as a child right from there, taught the Babylonian language, taught the Babylonian culture, but he never submitted to the Babylonian foods or, nor the Babylonian gods. Now, one thing we know about Daniel is he could see visions and he could interpret dreams. Okay. Uh, John 7 day, uh, it's a it's a PowerPoint presentation and it's not quite complete at the moment. But yes, I will share it once I'm done with my entire series on this. This could be a two or a three part video. Anyway, coming back to this, he could see visions and dreams and he lived through the reign of many kings like Nebuchadnezzar II, Nabudaidus, after Nebuchadnezzar, then Belshazzar then Cyrus the Great. Okay, so he's seen the rise and fall of many kings and a good couple of empires. And now the thing about Daniel is, in one particular chapter alone, rather chapter 11, Daniel has ended up talking about over 100 prophecies that have been fulfilled after his time over 100 prophecies in fact not just that he's also talked about messianic prophecies more specifically in daniel 9 okay now and this is where the problem is okay this is where the problem is so daniel's dating which we said could have been dated sometime around the time Daniel lived, which is mid fifth, sixth century BC, 530 BC. You know who was the first guy who challenged the, the dating? The first guy who challenged the dating was this philosopher, this pagan philosopher called as uh, Paul Fiery. Okay, excuse me if I am butchering his name, who lived sometime around the third century. Okay, and when is he making this challenge against Daniel? Around say 800 years after it was written. That's the first time this challenge is being made to Daniel, close to 800 years after Daniel is being written. And uh, now the thing about Paul Fiery is none of his works are present today. Paul Fiery, none of his works are present today, just to let you guys know. So how do we know this information that this guy was challenging Daniel? It's coming actually from our church father, St. Jerome, who lived in the late late 4th and, and the early 5th century. He's talking about Paul Fiery's work. That, uh, so this guy made that claim, Paul Fiery, that Daniel was written by a man in Judea, that is Judah or Palestine, Sometime during the reign of this guy, Antiochus Epiphanes, around the year 175 BC to 165 BC. Okay, so now if I'm saying Daniel was written somewhat around this time, and if you are saying this guy is claiming that it was written somewhat around this time, you can see that there's a difference of about 400 years. Okay, so according to him, Daniel was written 400 years later. It was not supposedly written during the time of the prophet Daniel. Did you get this point? I just want to see in the chat. Just want to see this in the chat if you got this point. Um, just waiting. Just StreamYard. That's a 10 second delay. Okay. But nobody took this guy, guy quite seriously, okay, Paul Fiery. Of course, until your modern liberal scholars started coming and butchering the Bible, okay, some 300, 400 years back in time, this is when this nonsense started, when people started attacking the Bible and, you know, brutally butchering it, okay, until the 1700s, that is the 18th century. Now, 
these are the views of liberal scholarship. These were the original views. Now you know most of liberal scholarship, most of it, I'm not saying all of it, it takes place under the premise of, say, presuppositions. What kind of presuppositions? Naturalistic presuppositions. Now, if I am a naturalist or an atheist, number one, I won't believe in predictive pro prophecy. Okay? I won't believe in predictive prophecy that somebody can so accurately predict the future. All right? So that's where it's just coming from. That's another reason why that's another reason why people want to date the Gospels late, okay? If you are looking into the traditional view of the church, all the three synoptics were written before 70 AD, long before the fall of the temple. And uh, John could have been written around that time or after that time, either or. But due to modern liberal scholarship, everybody has to say that the four Gospels were written after the, after the fall of the temple at Jerusalem. Why do modern liberal scholarships have to say that? Because the temple in Jerusalem fell in 70 AD. And since Jesus made this prediction that it's going to fall, they want this tap dance around this. The tap dance just starts over that, saying, nah, Jesus couldn't have said that. This thing could have been attributed to him later, some 40 or 50 years later, and so on and so forth. So, this is what they use. And then who turns out to be their source? Polyphyry himself. Okay. So Polyphyry's claims were, uh, Daniel is good at predicting future events. Okay. Supposed future events. But Daniel apparently did not know his own history when it came to his own time. So suppose, say, Ben Yosef is Daniel, right? <laughs> is rather the counterfeit Daniel, Ben Yosef. But Ben Yosef is good at telling me history 50 years ago, 50 years ago, okay? But Ben Yosef is not good at telling me history like, say, 500 years ago. So this is the claim these guys are making. They are saying Daniel would have definitely lived in the 2nd century BC. He definitely lived around this time, around 175 to 165 BC, whoever was the author of Daniel, because he's very accurate when it came to these things. But he was not very accurate when it came to the events of his, of his supposed time, 600 BC. So Ben Yosef, if somebody claimed Ben Yosef was living in the 1500 AD, this Ben Yosef didn't know his own history in 1500 AD. But he was good at telling me history in 1800 and 1900 AD. That's because Ben Yosef actually lived in 1800, between 1800 and 1900 AD. So this is the stupid claim they have to make, okay? And they talk about these things. Now, after this, after this, there are lots of other claims, like at least a dozen other objections still late, big objections. We'll examine all of them during this series. Grace to you, Bewitch Prophet of Islam. We'll examine all of these objections, okay, one by one. Now, if you are looking at Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, and Daniel chapter 11, you can just type that down in the chat. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and Daniel 11. Daniel talks about the rise and fall of four empires, four empires, okay? And I'll just go to Bible Hub for now, just a second. Bible Gateway. Okay, in the meantime, I'll just drop the Wikipedia article of Daniel over here. You guys can see it. And I'll just go to Daniel Bible. To New King James. So I'll just give you a short short story about about this prophecy. What's the context around Daniel? So Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Now Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar the second. That was his name. He was the king of Babylon, the first king of Babylon, who ruled around six. Uh, 
uh, can't remember his reign, but he died in 572 BC, roughly. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was so troubled that his, that his sleep left him. Okay. So it's kind of similar to Pharaoh and his dreams if you're reading Genesis. Then the king gave, gave the command to all the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. Okay. So they came. Now Chaldeans also just stand for astrologers and sorcerers of some sorts. Just to give you a brief over here, the word Chaldean is not referring to the Babylonians, although the, the word Chaldean used to be used interchangeably. In this context, it's actually referring to the wise men, sorcerers and magicians in this kingdom. So these guys came and stood before the king and the king said to him, I've had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Okay, so far so good. Then the Chaldean spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will give the interpretation. Okay. Because Aramaic was the language of the Babylonians. FYI. That's the reason why after the Jews came back from exile, they started employing Aramaic, more of Aramaic than Hebrew when they were speaking. Okay. Prior to this, they only used to speak Hebrew prior to the exile. Then the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. Okay. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will give its interpretation. So now the king is giving a somewhat unreasonable request. He's just saying that I won't even tell you the dream. You will have to decipher what the dream was and tell me this interpretation. But also in the way you can see the king has just identified these so-called magicians, sorcerers and astrologers are frauds. They are big time frauds much like the modern liberal scholars we see today. Frauds. Okay? Frauds. And this The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time because you see that my decision is firm. See, the king had figured them out that if he had told them the dream, then they would like ask for time, make something up, tell something to tickle his ears, and that's it. Okay? He would know that they would just lie and flatter him, bluff to him. But he was kind of serious because the dream really meant something to him. He was troubled. He was getting sleepless nights. So if you do not make the dream known to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know what you can give me its interpretation. There you go. Yup, tiger. They were going to use Takya to the king. All right, the king is really serious right now, and he really means it. Frauds tell me what the dream was. Otherwise, you guys are just frauds. I know that. Then the Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no one who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Uh, the same thing can be said about the so-called liberal scholars of ours. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Okay, so the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Now, wise men meaning? All these counselors, the king's advisors, could have been politicians, could have been astrologers, magicians, sorcerers, all that like, okay? In other words, the elite of society. Right now, we have these people. We have the politicians. We have Hollywood stars and celebrities. We have the tech giants and business tycoons. Uh, and of course, we have the academics and the scientific community, okay? 
same old story same old story same frauds same deceptions okay so god reveals nebuchadnezzar's dream so then with counsel and wisdom daniel answered arioch the captain of the king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men of babylon he answered and said to arioch the king's captain why is the decree from the king so urgent then arioch made the decision known to daniel so daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation then daniel went to his house and made the decision known to hananiah mishael and azariah his companions so those who are not aware much about daniel these are the three jewish kids who grew up with daniel and they were given different names like shadrach meshach and abednego they were given babylonian names similarly daniel was also given a babylonian name called as belteshazzar so he and his friends went that they might seek mercies from the god of heaven concerning the secret so that daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of babylon okay yes ahmed ghani shadrach meshach and abednego abednego then the secret was revealed to daniel in a night vision so daniel blessed the god of heaven so dan i'm just going to skip this word daniel just praised god for getting the vision okay and then he goes to nebuchadnezzar so i'll directly go to verse number 24 so daniel went to the king's guard arioch whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of babylon he went and said thus to him do not destroy the wise men of babylon take me before the king and i will tell the king the interpretation and uh, then king arioch just chanus god bless you good to see you then arioch quickly brought daniel before the king and said thus to him I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation captives meaning to say the exiles who have come here since Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed them then the king answered and said to Daniel whose name was Belteshazzar that was his Babylonian name okay are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation so Daniel answered the secret which the king has demanded the wise men the astrologers the magicians and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king but there is a god in heaven who reveals secret secrets now note now no please note daniel's humility daniel is giving all glory to god for his abilities okay he is not you know trying to make money out of it or being prideful or being so proud of it he is giving all glory to god for that gift and he has made known to king nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days that is what's going to be in the future and it is this part from here on that the butchery of daniel will start among your modern scholars and it's not just our modern scholars who believe this nonsense i'm um, just checking uh, in the chat how many of you have a good news bible a gnt bible good news translation of the bible can you please raise your hand right at home a good news translation of the bible can you please say one or yes i'm just checking that how many of you have a good news bible anyone at home a hard copy nobody siddharth you do okay marakti you do it's called good news translation good news bible Okay now those who have a good news bible can you just go to the place where you have the where you have the book of daniel only those who have the good news daniel just go to the page where the book of daniel starts and just read the prologue you will be shocked when you read the prologue really shocked uh marek sadart Did you get your Bibles out? Your Good News Bible. Just get it near you. I'll just uh, get mine actually because I have a copy with me, and I'm just going to shock you guys. Okay, really going to shock you guys. It's not just liberal scholarship. It is people who print Bibles who write this, and this view is also being taught in seminaries. Yes, John Seven Day. It's kind of blasphemous, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. 
good news translation is a good bible especially for kids when you're getting to know the bible i mean getting to read the bible and especially if for non english speakers because the language there is very simple okay but there are issues okay siddharth did you got it out yes no did you get your good news bible out go to the place where daniel starts and just read the prologue tell me what it says in the meantime so daniel is saying as for you o king thoughts come to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this and he who reveals secrets has made known to you what it will be but as for me the secret has not been revealed to me because i have more wisdom than anyone living but for our sakes who made known the interpretation to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your heart now here is the prophecy you o king were watching and behold a great image this great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and this form was awesome okay marak p you are on the phone no worries just when you go home or when the bible is in front of you the good news bible just open it go to the place where daniel is and read it and after that go and read the article on wikipedia it's just going to shock you this image's head was of fine gold its chest and armor of silver its belly and thighs of bronze its legs of iron its feet partly of iron and partly of clay you watched while a stone was cut out without hands which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces so daniel is describing that statue which nebuchadnezzar had seen in the dream and the statue was made of different elements gold silver clay and iron for different parts from the top to the bottom are you guys with me just need to see that on the chat okay cool then the iron the clay the bronze the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain that filled the whole earth okay mysterious dream all right okay uh rasulullah i'm not going to debate you right now i'm in the middle of a session okay so please quick keep quiet and watch otherwise we'll just time you out for the time being okay this is the dream now we tell the interpretation of it before the king you or king are a king of kings for the god of heaven has given you a kingdom power strength and glory and wherever the children of men dwell or the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all you are this head of gold okay so now he is telling nebuchadnezzar that you are the head of gold in that statue but after you an other kingdom shall arise inferior to yours then another a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth and the fourth kingdom will be shall be as strong as iron in as much as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything and like iron that crushes that kingdom will break and pieces and crush all the others okay whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of the potter's clay and partly of iron the kingdom shall be divided yet the strength of the iron shall be in it just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay okay and as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay they will mingle with the seed of men but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay and in the days of these kings the god of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed now take a note of verse 44 guys he will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people it shall break in pieces and consume all these other kingdoms and it shall stand 
forever. Yes, Dardir Drua, the Iron Kingdom was the Romans, the one with iron and clay. That was the one of the Roman Empire. So I'll come to that. In as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountains without hands, that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made to you the king which will pass after this. This dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Now the same prophecy kind of gets reiterated in many different details in Daniel 7, in Daniel chapter 8, and in Daniel chapter 11. Okay, and this is what makes these scholars, these modern liberal scholars, go completely crazy. Okay, uh, Dorothy Idrua, the Roman Empire did crumble, it did get defeated by the stone which came over the, the kingdom of God. But that's, some, that's something else which you need to be aware of, called as a uh, something which is here the kingdom of god is here christians we are christians trinitarians but it's still not you know completely implemented it's already here but not completely implemented it'll only be completely be implemented after jesus comes again okay so we know that this is our traditional view just a second and go back to the slideshow We know like this is the traditional view. Now in the traditional view, which is the left-hand side of the figure, these are the four kingdoms, okay? Sorry about this, guys. There are some typos from my previous video, so I need to actually fix my slides. Babylonian Empire, Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, then the Roman Empire. All right, we have all this, okay? This is the traditional view of the early church and the church, more or less. This is a traditional view about this thing. But now if you're going to look at the liberal views, they have isogeted the prophecy to make it look, to make it match their naturalistic presuppositions. They have isogeted this prophecy, okay? They are saying it's the Babylonian Empire. Okay, the first one was correct. But now look at the audacity. They have broken the Medo-Persian Empire into two different empires. They have called it the Median Empire and the Persian Empire. And then they have called it the Greek Empire. Why do you think they have not included the Roman Empire? Anyone? Why do you think they decided not to include the Roman Empire? Ahmad Ghani? Ken? Why do you think the liberal scholars do not want to include the Roman Empire, but they ended up doing this tap dance of breaking the Median Empire and the Persian Empire together? Yep, the Roman Empire came later. It didn't come around the time they say Daniel was written. See, if I'm going back, they are saying Daniel was written around this time. The Roman Empire, Emil, yes, you're kind of partially correct, came about a hundred years later came about a hundred years later of this dating, okay? So now that is why these frauds want to tap dance around it and say that uh, Daniel was written around 165 BC. Why? Because Daniel knows the event so much until like 165 BC. And then they decided to isogeet the prophecy in Daniel 9 to say that it was the Greek empire who fulfilled that prophecy. Okay, yeah, that was the Greek empire. Because for their 165 BC dating, there's still a problem. Because the Roman Empire came to Judea much later. It came to Judea about one century later. Okay, about one century later. So that's one big deception these guys want to play. Also, in Daniel 9, there is a prophecy. I'll go through it, not today's session, in the other session. It's a messianic prophecy, okay? It is a messianic prophecy. It starts, it's Daniel 9. Uh, verses 24 to verses 28, roughly that time. Daniel 9, verse 24 to verse 28, it is a messianic prophecy. Okay? And according to Jesus, 
that part of the prophecy was yet to be fulfilled and it only was going to get fulfilled around the time the temple was going to get destroyed daniel jesus talked about it in matthew 24 i'll cover that part later whereas these frauds want to say that part of the prophecy was got, got was gotten fulfilled when the greeks took, took over the temple and they desecrated it okay so coming back over here here we see the people sorry wrong i'm just using some of my previous slides so ignore that information so now the liberals will say media and persia were two empires and greece is the fourth this is how they want to lie and be intellectually dishonest this is still a problem because if you'll ask any historian any historian they will tell you that the medo persian empire was one empire it was never two empires because kings like cyrus cyrus was always called as the king of the persians and the medes it was always one empire the medo persian empire but what they want to claim now is the median empire existed separately which is a fact the median empire did you know but it was it was not really an empire what cyrus did was he brought down the medes he brought down the medes and then he combined the persian and the median empire together that became the medo persian empire because cyrus take note take note of this point cyrus was half persian and half a mede from his mother's side cyrus was a mede a median okay but from his so the medes are the kurds today the present day kurds historians and say uh genet you know genetic scientists and all these guys people are into genetic studies have determined that the kurds today the kurds they are the medes okay the other medes the persians are the iranians or the iranians whom we see today so cyrus had actually unified them together and they formed the medo persian empire then came the greeks came and came the romans so now liberals still want to tap dance they are saying that there are some historical issues in the book of daniel okay lots of historical issues in the book of daniel now before that we can just have a look at the wikipedia article in daniel i'll just uh, drop the link let's read through it guys uh, i'll just read through it here see how they start see the first line right in wikipedia itself just make it to 200% the first line right inside wikipedia it reads the book of daniel is a second century bc biblical apocalypse with a 6th century bc setting okay look at the audacity they want to take the word of the liberal scholars and they want to write their wikipedia page and also look at the other audacity bc before common era earlier we used to say bc and ad right now they want to say bc and ac meaning to say before common era and after common era you ask these idiots uh what why is it called common era and after common era, after common era they won't be able to explain okay it used to be before christ and and then after that anno domini the year of the lord this is how they start an account of the activities and visions of daniel a noble jew exiled at babylon okay so these are all the objections they want to give and then it just talks about the book and then uh, of course you know what the book is now they want to talk about the authorship and lots of other things they want to say that it is a set of fables it's generally accepted that daniel originated as a collection of aramaic code tales later expanded by the hebrew revelations there you go this is so much of fraud and ken narida certain biblical translations of ours certain biblical translations of ours uh actually even so a lot of bibles actually lots of bibles right now they actually have this view that daniel was fiction 
that he was a pseudograph that this book is pseudographically written so they want to put it at the level of books like enoch and all these things okay oh yeah john 7 day they will always say that hinduism is millions of years old and all this nonsense oh ben yosef quick timing him out he's telling he's actually telling the truth uh, just go easy on him but the scriptures date to 900 ad only you are correct john 7 day there is no evidence of hindu manuscripts prior to 900 or say even 500 ad and when it comes to the quran the holy quran h o l e y holy quran you 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 want to see the tap dance they want to play with the holy quran i'll just show you that i'll just go to see uh the birmingham manuscript wikipedia so according to islamic scholars the birmingham manuscript this particular manuscript it's the oldest extant manuscript and they actually claim it's only two pages it's only two pages oh yeah john 7 sorry uh sorry sorry dragon generous just avoid using language over here okay that's fine you can put stars if you want to but just avoid using language okay uh if you are going to the birmingham manuscript now what's it saying in 2015 the manuscript which is held by the university of birmingham that's in uk was radiocarbon dated to between 568 and 4 and 645 ce now do you know what is 645 ce that is around the time of muhammad and 568 is actually say before the time of muhammad so two years before the time of muhammad but then they want to say that it could have been it's written on the book on parchment using an arabic it's hijazi script as clearly legible the leaves preserve parts of surahs that is quran chapter 18 to 20 it was based on display okay so now if i'm going to the part of the significance the significance so according to them this is a first century quran for them and muslims will laugh at you saying that there is no first century manuscript of the new testament but we have a first century manuscript of the quran it's only two pages guys it's only two pages and they want to cry a lot about this it's only two pages okay yeah jibril could only preserve two pages but now this is a problem now here here comes the problem for them now the proposed radio comic dating for the manuscript is 570 to 632 bc according to sunni tradition it was abu bakr the first caliph who compiled the quran and uthman who canonized the standard version of quran since accepted and used by all the muslims worldwide then he commanded that all previous versions be burnt so now which version can it be because if they are saying that if this quran was dated sometime around that time was it abu bakr's quran which got burnt and somehow this copy survived or was it part of the original uthmanic quran i have no idea guys because uthman burned the quran about 20 years after muhammad's time all of them and then made up his own so we don't even know if this these were one of the pages okay now in the university announcement so i'm just going down Okay so now this is what they want to talk this is when they talk to would want to talk the muslim community was not wealthy enough to stockpile animal skills for decades really they had a caliphate for crying out loud man these guys had an empire they actually had an empire right after muhammad died unlike the christians for 300 years we didn't have any political power we were writing you know manuscripts on parchment material hiding and writing it but as these guys are an empire uthman could order people to like get all the manuscripts together burn them and then create their own standardize it and to produce a complete mushaf or a mushaf or a copy of the holy quran required a great many of them the carbon dating evidence then indicates that blah 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 home to some precious would have been center of mushaf from that period and seems to leave open the possibility that the uthmanic redaction took place earlier than had been thought or even conceivably that these folios predate that process so now they are thinking that maybe this uthmanic quran burning could have happened before or 
these pages in your Quran predate that process. In any case, now this is what these scholars want to say about the Quran. In any case, this along with the sheer beauty of the content and the surprisingly clear Hijazi script is news to rejoice Muslim hearts. Okay, it's news to rejoice Muslim hearts. This is what how the scholars are biased. Now I'll just come to some other manuscript, okay, of the Bible and see how they tap dance. See how these frauds tap dance. See, now this is what they say. This means that the parts of the Quran that are written in the parchment within a degree of confidence can be dated to less than two decades after Muhammad's death. These portions must have been in a form that is very close to the form of the Quran read today. Now they're just making a claim, saying that these portions must have been in a form that is very close to the form of a Quran read today. They are just making this stupid claim, these assertions. Get the Quran which is read today in Arabic, get those folios and just compare them and see with a native Arabic speaker. They'll just tell you like how many differences are there. Supporting the view that the text has undergone little or no alteration and that it can be dated to a point very close to the time it was believed, <laughs> believed to be revealed. Oh my gosh. Yeah, right. John 7 day. This is Sharia Pedia. It is Sharia Pedia to tell you the truth. It's not Wikipedia. How they attack Daniel. And look at them all praise for the Quran. And they didn't even question the dating. I'll tell you why they don't question the dating. <laughs> okay. So now, if I am coming to another article, uh, let's say the John Ryland's papyrus. Sorry. Just go Sean Ryland's manuscript Wikipedia. Okay. So the John Ryland's papyrus, it's the oldest, the oldest copy, the oldest manuscript copy that we have of the Gospel of John. Okay, we have of the Gospel of John. John Ryland's papyrus. Take a note of that, guys. John Ryland's papyrus. Just reduce the size a little bit. And John Ryland's papyrus, it dates to, originally dates to, John Ryland's, I'll just type it down, papyrus. It originally dates to around 125 to 140 AD, original radiocarbon date, okay? This is the date, this is the earliest copy we have about John's gospel. It's only this fragment here, you can see that. Just this small fragment over here, but it contains a very critical part. It contains portions of say chapter, John chapter 18, which is the trial of, you could say this guy, a Jesus, trial of Jesus by Pilate. Okay, when Peter, when, when Pilate is questioning him. Now, now read this point, read this point. This was the original date actually, 125 AD. Then after that, they did more tests. They got it to 175 AD. And now what they are claiming is recent research points the date nearer to 200 AD. Just imagine when it comes to the Bible, they don't want to give that kind of charity. They don't want to give any charity to the Bible. But when it comes to the Quran and these Hindu manuscripts and stuff, oh my gosh. Tell me, folks, is this not proof of you know dem demonic possession among all these so-called scholars and academics? Okay, now this is the fun part. This is the fun part. Now you can see the content over here about the dating. If I'm scrolling down here to the dating section, just look at the tap dance people have done concerning the dating. So if I'm clicking here on the date, the date, and if I'm just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. <laughs> just imagine there's a lot of debate on the date. But just did you see Birmingham manuscript when it came to the Quran? Nobody wants to have any debates on it. Ah, oh, yeah, it was written around the time of Muhammad. It existed around within two decades of Muhammad's time. Case closed. Not so much of critical analysis of, as we see, which is being done on the Bible, on any book in the Bible. Okay. Second Peter was not written by Peter. Hebrews was not written by Paul. 
the Gospels were not written by eyewitnesses. They were written by later, later people. Daniel was uh, written 400 years later. Isaiah was written by at least three different people at different points in time. This is all the nonsense they have to fabricate. Okay. Congratulations, Tardi Rua. Very good. You did that. Okay. So this is, okay, coming back to the topic. Sorry, I got driven away by my line of thought. Okay. So as I said, coming back over here. So when these guys don't want to admit that that Rome can't fit into their schema, they start making the historical objections argument. Okay, the historical objections argument that history that there are mistakes. All right. Okay, now let's go have a look at the first historical objection. Now the first historical objection says that. Darius the Mede or Darius the Mede is a myth. Now, Darius the Mede is the king of the Medo Persian Empire who had thrown Daniel into the lion's den. You know that story. It's in Daniel chapter 6. Okay. Now, what these frauds want to say is that Darius the Mede did not really exist. Because there is no historical evidence to point to a Darius the Mede existing in the 6th century BC, that is in the 500 BCs. Did you get that point, guys? Need to check. What was, the, what was my point about Darius the Mede? That he is a myth. Just need to check in the chat. Just need to check the chat. Um, just waiting for your response. Okay. So now there are arguments. Now these are all their arguments they want to throw. They say that we can't find any historical proof of Darius the Mede. Fine. And now they want to say that in Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, Darius the Mede, he had a father. He had a father whose name was either Aserus in the Hebrew or Xerxes in the Greek. Okay. Now we know that in the book of Esther, there is a king called as Aserus or Xerxes in the book of Esther. But this king Xerxes or Aserus lived about 50 years after this Darius the Mede. Okay. Or about two generations later. So they said that this thing is a historical mistake. So naturally, if Daniel was written in 165 BC, there's no point. So it's very likely that a person would have made a made an error about somebody who lived in 500 BC. Okay, since he didn't know history that well, so they just want to make that claim that this is the first historical mistake. Since Xerxes was the son of Darius I, historically speaking, now this Xerxes is the Xerxes in the Book of Esther. He was the son of Darius I. Darius I is kind of mentioned, I think, in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, if I'm not wrong, and lived half a century later, half a century after this Darius the Mede. Okay, just to give you a point. Now, Darius the Mede was then followed by the second king, Cyrus the Great of Persia. Okay, now just to give you a bit of information, I'll just share. Just to break this down to you guys, um, just go to my notepad. Edit. Uh, view. Sorry, format, word, font. I'll just make the font a bit bigger for you guys to see. Okay. So now they want to say that this guy, Darius, the meet. Did not exist historically. Why? Because no king called Darius existed among the Persians or the Medes between, say, 600, 550. 
to say 530 BC period, which is say Daniel's timeline. Are you guys able to see the screen? Is the text big enough? I could just make it bigger for those who are using the phone. Is the text big enough, guys? I just want to check, just seeing the one. Um, just waiting for your guys' response. Okay, if it's big, uh, especially the those who are on this. Okay, it's a little smaller. I'll just make the view a little bit bigger than if you're seeing if it's a little smaller. Okay, I think it's good enough now. Okay. Okay, it's clear. Okay, all good. Thanks for letting me know, John 7 day. So now they want to say that this Darius in Daniel 9, Darius's father was Xerxes, Greek name, or Osiris, the Hebrew name. Okay. Now, the problem they want to state is there was a king named Xerxes or an Osiris who lived about, say, 40 to 60 years after the supposed Darius to meet. Okay, so that's the problem. So they are saying this is a historical error. And Xerxes or Osiris was the son of Darius the first. So they want to say whoever wrote Daniel made this blunder. He not only got the wrong character at the wrong place at the wrong time in history, but he also confused the father for the son and the son for the father. This is what they want to say and tap dance around this thing when they are proven wrong with respect to the prophecy part of things. They are saying, nah, it's still gotten problems. Okay. Let's see what are the other objections. Okay, now the other objection is again coming from the Bible itself. And what's more, they said that now history says Cyrus conquered Babylon, okay, in 539 BC, okay. But our Bible says the Medes, Persians did conquer them. Did conquer Babylon. But the name of the conqueror was Darius the Mede and not Cyrus. Okay. Now they want to make this claim that the name of this conqueror was Darius the Mede and not Cyrus because say Daniel 5 and Daniel 6 says so. So the Bible is wrong about history. This is how they tap dance. So our Bible is wrong, guys. Now, how is this objection answered? It also says in Daniel 6, that uh, Cyrus came to rule after Darius the Mede. Another issue. So we guys should just throw away our Bibles, just accept that it is fiction with some maybe some good stories to just teach us about morals. And that's about it. The rest is just mumbo jumbo. Oh yeah, Rasuala, like your holy Kurap, which got corrupted right when Uthman burned it. Uthman burned all those copies. Why did Uthman do that? And Rasulullah, show me one complete copy of the Quran which, uh, which Uthman had. 
which is still there and compare it with the Arabic today. A complete copy, all the pages, all the 6,636 verses, compare it with the Quran, which is that today, and just show it to me that nothing has changed in Arabic. If you are able to prove that, I'm ready to take the Shahada. Okay? I'm ready to take the Shahada. Anyway, keep these uh, demonic dogs, these demons in check. Just time them out. Don't block them. I'll have their word with them. Okay? So now this is what they want to say. How do we get out of this issue? These are very powerful objections concerning the Bible, concerning even Daniel's historicity, authenticity, and all these kind of things. Okay. Now, how do we answer this? Let's come back here. So now there is one argument. There are actually two arguments. This is the weaker argument around Darius the Mede's identity. This is the weaker argument. Now, the Babylonians used to rule their conquered regions using certain regional governors. Now, for example, after the temple in Judea, in Judah, had fallen in 586 BC and the Babylonians had taken it down, they had made a regional governor called as the king, called as Gedaliah, to rule over it as, as a governor. And now we know that people in those times used to even call generals or say small governors as kings in those times, like puppet kings. Yes, Ahmad Ghani, you got it. Puppet kings like Herod, Herod the Tetrarch, Herod the Great, all, all the Herodians. They were actually just puppet kings who were actually serving the actual emperor who was Caesar. Okay, so it's just a biblical and a Near Eastern worldview. People just used to call these guys as kings. So this is one plausible worldview. Also, it's possible, it's possible that Darius could have been the name, the other name given to Guberu or Ukparu, the general who actually overthrew Babylon in 539 BC. Okay, that could have been his other name. This is one possibility. But uh, we could just say, but it's still quite a weak argument. The skeptic would still say, yeah, but then why is he given the name Darius? It's quite significant. And why is he called as the Mede? Darius the Mede as if he's some big powerful ruler or something like that. They would just say, your argument sounds reasonable, but it's still quite this. Now we have an even more powerful argument for this. Okay, Using history and the Bible itself. A more powerful argument for this is Darius could have been Cyrus himself. Okay. Darius could have been Cyrus himself. Why? Why, 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 why? Okay. For that, we need to do a bit of mathematics, a bit of history, and a bit of our Bible. Okay. Now, Darius the Mede conquered Babylon when he was 62 years of age in 539 BC. Daniel chapter number 5, verse number 31 says this. Okay. Ahmad Ghani, this is kind of more recent and it's more new, newer evidence. Daniel chapter number 5, verse 31 says this. Now, your historians, now this is not what our Bible says, the second point. Our second point actually says that Cyrus lived from 600 BC to 530 BC. Okay, uh, 600 BC to 530 BC. What would have been Cyrus's age when he died? Any guesses? 600 BC to 530 BC. Ahmad Ghani, John Seven Day. What? How old was Cyrus when he died, King Cyrus? Any guesses? Simple mathematics. Simple mathematics. Cyrus was about 70 years old when he died in 530 BC. He was killed in a war, in battle. But now note the year. The year here is 539 BC. That's when 
Babylon had fallen to the Medes and the Persians. If I'm going to count 539 BC, Cyrus was definitely in his 62nd year when Babylon fell. But now the Bible says that Darius the Mede was 62 years when Babylon fell. But secular history tells us that Cyrus was 62 years when Babylon fell. Okay. Now here is another point. I had mentioned this at the start of the video. Now, it's possible that Cyrus would have been known by two identities or two names. Okay, now the Jews used to call him names like, say, Kurush. The Persians used to call his name as Koresh, which got later today, it's called Cyrus. And Cyrus the Great, he was half a Median. He was half a Mede. Okay, he was half a Mede. His mother was a Mede. He was raised as a Mede. There, there is a story that Cyrus was actually prophesied to take over his grandfather's kingdom. His grandfather, Astyages, he was the king of Media, and it was actually prophesied. There is a Babylonian tale, I mean a Persian tale about this, that Cyrus was actually going to take his, take his grandfather's kingdom. So what does Astyages do? He tried to kill Cyrus's mother, who was his daughter. Cyrus's mother was Astyages' daughter, but they escaped, and then Cyrus was brought up, and Astyages had given him a median name, okay? And also, there are historians like Herodotus. Now, Herodotus lived some about 100 years after the events of Daniel, about 100 years later, sometime around, say, the 5th century BC. Now, Herodotus mentions twice, twice, okay, twice, okay? that Cyrus was known by a different name. Because, and he was called this name by his mother. His mother was a Mede. Okay. Now, Darius the Mede is just a way of just indicating the person's, say, descent. Now, say, in the olden times, if people used to have a claim over kingship or over the throne, they had to claim that they are part of that race or part of that person. So if Cyrus was called the king of the Persians and the Mede, it's possible that he was using the title Darius the Mede to get along with his subjects from the from media. Okay. And he could be known as Koresh or Cyrus among the Persians. All right. So this is where it gets interesting. And now in the previous slide I kind of talked about Cyrus. Sorry. That, uh, that uh, sorry, I'm getting a bit discombobulated. That uh, fabricated character, Cyrus or Osiris or Xerxes was his name. It could be thought that the actual name could have been Astyages, whom Cyrus overthrew to seize power. That is his grandfather. And you know that people, even in the Old Testament and the New Testament, Sometimes when they used to refer to a significant ancestor, they used to always call that person as father. Like Jesus is called as the son of David. Although David is not his father, he's called as the son of David since he's a descendant of David. Okay, same thing. And the Israelites used to call Abraham as their father. Okay, he was not their direct father. He was their forefather. The same thing can be said about Cyrus. Okay. Now, according to the Jewish historian Josephus in Antiquities, he also mentions that Astyages was the last king of the Median Empire and plausibly identified by the Hebrew name Asurus. Okay, so Asurus or that Xerxes we talked about before could have actually been Astyages. All right. Okay. Now, there is another argument people want to make. There are two more historical arguments I want to go across. Hey, God bless you, Somali Christian TV. Good to see you. There are two more historical arguments, but I'm not going to cover them today. Okay. Two more historical errors in Daniel. After that, there are other things like there are linguistic problems.
okay two is canon problems okay any other problems you guys can remember because there are at least some more to go Jewish canon problems and then you could say problems in deuterocanonical writing Sirak. okay so if you happen to be catholic or orthodox you guys will accept Sirak as scripture if you happen to be Protestant, no issues. It's all right. You guys can still read it. There's a lot over there because even our church fathers and New Testament writers used to quote messianic prophecies from Sirach, just to let you know. Okay. So now I'll just cover this point in Sirach. If you have the book of Sirach, now Sirach mentions, he mentions Abraham, Adam, uh, Noah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. He mentioned all these guys. Moses, David. He mentions the three major prophets and the 12 minor prophets. Uh, who are the three major prophets? Any idea? Do you guys recall? Who are the three major prophets? Three major prophets in the Old Testament. So Sirach gives a summary of the Old Testament. So just to let you know in one particular chapter. On characters who are wisdom. Yeah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, they were the three major prophets. Uh, Daniel wasn't the prophet, according to Sirach, three major prophets. Okay. If you go talk to any Jew today, they'll just say Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah. They won't necessarily say that Daniel was a prophet. Okay, and it does mention the 12 minor prophets, but uh, huh? Daniel is missing. Do you know when was Sirach written? Sirach was written originally sometime between, say, 300 BC to 250 BC. Okay, originally. Then translated by his grandson to Greek in 150 BC, sometime later, around say 200 to say 150 BC, roughly around this time it was translated to Greek. So it was written originally in Hebrew, sometime in this year, and it was translated to Greek by his grandson sometime around this time. So now the skeptic will say. Haha, -ha, it doesn't mention Daniel because if you're saying Daniel was written, so skeptic says if Daniel was written in say 520 BC, 530 BC, and uh, Sirach was written in Whatever, 250 BC. Sirach doesn't mention it. Does not mention Daniel, but he mentions all the other major characters of the Old Testament. So, this is how they make the case, which is proof, according to them, Daniel was written after Sirach, that is around 165 BC. This is how they want to make this proof. But now, what skeptics don't tell you about Sirach? What skeptics don't tell you?
Sirach does not mention Job, okay, who lived around say maybe 2000 to 1500 BC, around some sometime around that time. Sirach does not mention Ezra, and Ezra lived around say 500 BC to say 450 BC, roughly around that time. He does not mention any of these guys. Okay. So what's the big deal if he does if he doesn't mention Daniel directly? I don't see that point. And now the same secular scholars will agree that Ezra lived around 500 to 450 BC. They'll actually agree on that point. Okay. They'll actually agree on that point. This is how our skeptics tap dance just to get through one to the other. Yep. Oh uh, yeah, Ahmad Ghani, they will tap dance around that Ezekiel objection as well. Ezekiel mentions Daniel they, in Ezekiel chapter 14 and, Ez, and Ezekiel chapter 28, but they will tap dance around that. I will do that in a separate session, okay, about how we get past their arguments. All right, according to them, this is not the same Daniel we guys are talking about, that it's not the biblical Daniel, it is somebody else. Okay? This is how these guys want to tap dance. They are so biased towards contemporary prophecies, they'll get objection after objection after objection. And I just showed you a while back, when it comes to the Quran or when it comes to some Hindu scripture, they just play hypocrite. Okay? They just take it at face value and then praise it. But when it comes to the Bible, oh my gosh. If these hypocrites, these so-called scholars, were, were to even apply 5% of that skepticism which they put on the Bible on any book in history or any of the other scriptural texts, then we might as well even say that much of history we know is just myth. To tell you the truth, after all this criticism, the Bible still passes with flying colors generally speaking whereas these guys are so biased it's not an intellectual problem Ahmad Ghani it's just hardening of the heart it's a spiritual problem it is a demonic influence it's demonic influence uh, you could say which is driving all these elite in the society just to attack the bible to attack Christianity to attack history and all these things as you know it okay like I mentioned at the start, there was this pagan philosopher who made that claim sometime in the third century that Daniel was myth. They never really took that claim seriously until the 18th century. Okay, that's after the post enlightenment began. And that's this, and now they are accepting it as truth that Daniel was written in this period. Okay, in this period instead of saying Daniel was written 400 years previously. And that's the same rubbish people have to talk about the Council of Nicaea, by the way. You know this myth about the Council of Nicaea deciding the books of the Bible? It was actually a myth which was kind of propagated sometime in the 9th century, but it never got popular. But then a thousand years later, you had these Enlightenment thinkers like Voltaire, who really hated the church, especially the Catholic church, who actually popularized that myth. And now people think that it's a fact, the whole thing about the Council of Nicaea. Just so much, man. Like any, even a serious historian, a secular historian will, you know, deny that myth. Okay. So this is where we are at today. There is more ground to cover about even Sirach as such, because Sirach also mentions Daniel indirectly. He mentions him. Indirectly, he mentions him, but I'll cover that sometime next session. Okay. So let's have a look. So I just kind of said that Darius the Mede is, could possibly be Cyrus the Great. There is very strong evidence to suggest that. Now, these are the other historical issues I'll probably cover this week. They come one after the other. Okay. And there are some linguistic objections. That itself would take a while, maybe equivalent to a session. 
then there are canonical objections. I just talked about Ben Sirach Sirach, there's something. And then after that, I need to give some bit of good news also about evidence which is on our side. Or even these objections can be refuted by evidence on our side, but there are also some other things which have got to do with evidence which come strongly posits from our side. All right. So I'll just stop sharing my screen. Okay. And uh, I'd like to say that thank you so much, guys, for being here, for your support. And uh, I'll probably do part two and part three of this series sometime later this week, God willing, or by next weekend, God willing. Okay. Just keep me in prayers, guys, and at my side of the world in f about five minutes' time, I'll be a year older. So just keep me in prayers. Okay, God bless you all. And I hope you are blessed and edified by the session. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much.